All right, Ava, welcome to Money Bites. Thanks. Happy to be here. <laughs> Money Bites is presented by Winnie, a community of women in tech and allies where we talk openly about our money journey. Can you first share a one liner of yourself? A one liner? Yeah, I am. Uh, so my name is Ava. Um, I'm based in L.A. I work in tech and outside of work um, in my free time, I spend a lot of time outdoors, sort of as much as possible. Sounds great. What do you do? So I work at a tech company um, in sort of the market intelligence space, and my role is product specialist, and it's sort of um, the connection or sort of the intersection between customer success and product. Customer success and product. Okay. So that yep. probably means you're helping them understand the product platform and how to use it? Yep, exactly, exactly. Lovely. And final question, what is a trivia about yourself that people might not know? A trivia? Um, good question. Um, well, <clears throat> um, I love to travel and I traveled um, a fair bit, but... Um, the only state that I haven't been to is Minnesota, which is sort of a random, random tidbit, if you will. <laughs> okay. Do you have any plans to go there anytime soon? At some point, at some point I will go. Um, I have nothing against it. It's just like sort of out of the way. I don't know that I have any family that really lives there. Um, like a reason to go there other than to go to Minnesota. Gotcha. Well, if any of our winner community members have a valid striking reason to visit Minnesota, please let us know in the comments. And I'll definitely share it with Ava. Cool. So we're going to look at how you got into your current role. We're going to go way back into the beginning. You didn't major in something related to tech. You majored in something very particular. Can you <laughs> share what your college major yeah. was? Yes, I did not major in anything related to tech or business or anything like that. Um, so I majored in geography, um, specifically human geography, which is sort of similar in a way to anthropology. Folks tend to be more familiar with anthropology. Um, and no, geography is not just the study of maps. It's more so the sort of interrelatedness between people, places, and, and things with the uh, sort of underpinning idea that space and place are important aspects of a lot of things, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of ideas, a lot of, a lot of things. And, um, <clears throat> I, I sort of happened upon geography. My dad for a long time was a professor of geography. So it was something that I was familiar with and knew, but I never went into school sort of um, with a plan to major in geography. It just sort of happened that way because I was undecided at first and explored a few majors. I love how you said connections between people and places. And now you're doing connection between people and product in platforms. Um, Interesting. You seem to like linking things together. I think that linking between things, like understanding that things don't exist in a void is super important, whether in, you know, your professional setting, personal setting. Um, and I think that's kind of a big, uh, one of the biggest takeaways for me from, from what I learned in school. I love the critical thinking aspect and also the importance you're setting in context. Um, working in tech, one thing that I've realized over and over is how important communicating the context is mm -hmm. and truly that nothing happens <clears throat> in a vacuum. So how did you go from the love of geography into tech? You moved right after college. Was that intended? Move as in um, like into, the, into, into a job or like location physically? As in job, as in career. Well, I thought it would be sort of a good way to 
dip my toes in the business world without having kind of any clue about that. I never took a business class, a finance class, marketing class or anything like that in school. Um, So I was like, you know, what the heck, you know, I'll sort of try it out. And it was an opportunity to move to New York City at the time. So before we go into your current company, one thing that was interesting was your career satisfaction graph. You just started off super high. And then it nose dives. What was happening at that point? I thought it was going to be more of a research driven job. And it was less sort of research driven and more similar to like a combination of light research and um, sort of sales development ish type of role where there was like a lot of cold calling and a lot of cold outreach which was a completely foreign topic to me. So that's why I was like really excited at first because I had kind of high expectations and then settling in a few months into the job, sort of realizing that it was a kind of a lot different than I expected. Um, and of course, getting paid like 50,000, 50 something thousand a year in New York City is difficult. So having gone through that experience, do you feel there are lessons learned on how to spot those red flags in terms of gaps in the JD? Yes, definitely. I think, um, like, first of all, the terms, the terms that are used in the corporate world, um, I just have a better understanding of what those are. But I think also really in the interviewing process, you hear a lot that you're interviewing them as much as they are interviewing you. And that is so, like, so much the case. And for this role that I came into now, I really tried to do as much due diligence as possible and really interview them back and determine whether it was a company I wanted to work for, a team that I wanted to work for, and a manager that I wanted to work under. Um, And the kind of, you know, culture and, 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 and environment that I wanted to be in. So I think, um, asking all of like the right questions, sort of, you know, what are the most important things to you? And then writing down good questions to ask the interviewer is really important. That's a really good advice. I want to also touch the point of the sticker price shocks of living in New York. How did you manage? Like, did you start budgeting? I lived with roommates. My first apartment was like this loft room in this apartment. I was in Hell's Kitchen, which was like convenient for my work because my work was sort of right near Times Square. So I could walk to work and I cooked primarily at home and budgeted when I would go out to eat or go out to a bar with friends because I had friends who had moved into the city, people that I knew from school, people from, you know, that I met at work. Um, but I couldn't afford to go out to like lunch and dinner and brunch every weekend. So I had to sort of choose, you know, when I was doing that. And so I spent a lot of time sort of exploring the city by myself, which was actually really cool. Um, and that's a great way to not spend a ton of money in New York is just to walk around just to like go to a neighborhood. Well, in this period, there was a time when there was a slight increase in your net worth graph. And that's also the time when your career satisfaction also increases. It seems you were still in the same company at that time. So internally, you were making changes. What were the proactive moves that you were making? I had a few different roles at my initial company. The first two were sort of similar. The second one was similar to the first, but just a little bit more autonomy. Um, and a boss who I enjoyed like working with and a team that was a bit smaller and we were a little bit separated from the rest of the team. So we can sort of do our own thing a little bit more. And then I had, I got an entirely new role that I guess I was, I was in for a year, year and a half or something like that. I just sort of tried to, to focus on exceeding expectations as much as I could in every aspect of the job so that I could get to that next role um, as quickly as possible. And it eventually it happened. I got a pay increase 
and my satisfaction with the job went up a lot more because it was a it was a different job, a completely different sort of team dynamic. So you take on these roles within the same company, you continue to up level yourself. And then you kind of plateau for a bit, but afterwards, you have a huge spike in your career satisfaction, and that's with a change of a new company. Mm. Was your mm-hmm. criteria different this time around on what you were searching for? Yeah, definitely. I was searching for something that was not going to be um, the same every day. I looked for something that was... Um, you know, I had a lot of experience speaking to, uh, like speaking to clients and something client facing I thought would be, would be interesting, but where the role had sort of, you had the opportunity to kind of wear different hats, um, and understanding what the day-to-day really looked like. So, you know, asking the manager, the, hi- the hire manager, you know, what's every day, what does the day-to-day look like? And speaking to someone who's actually on the team and getting an understanding of what the day-to-day look like. Um, So that was super important, as well as a role where you had sort of enough autonomy um, to do what, like, as long as you're doing well in your role, you can make decisions and you don't have to sort of have them okayed by your manager every time. Um, That was super important to me. And then I found out about this product specialist role, which was this unique blend of customer customer success and client facing, but also um, where you get to have this deep understanding of the, the product that we sell. One thing that I thought was really interesting with your satisfaction graphs is you continue to improve while it goes through some highs and so lows in your career satisfaction graph, whereas your life satisfaction graph is steadily up and to the right. It's, it was a straight line. I was interested to hear if you divorce your career in life. Mm. I guess, well, no, not entirely. Um, I want to be happy in my job hundred percent, right? I'm working, you I'm working every day, Monday through Friday, you know, during the work day. So I want to be happy in my job for sure. I want to like the people that I'm working with and I want to feel definitely satisfaction in my job, um, and feel like I'm making some sort of impact in whatever I'm doing. But also I sort of recognize at the, at a certain point that for me, I work to live, so, um, like, I don't know that I'll ever, I mean, maybe who knows what the future holds, but I hold a lot of importance in everything that happens outside of work mm-hmm. and having a good work-life balance is very important to me and being able to do the things that I like to do outside of work and spend time with the people, um, that I want to spend time with outside of work is equally really important. Because when I turn 60 years old, I want to look back and think I did all the right things. Like I, I did what I wanted to do. Um, and I didn't do it because society had some sort of expectations of me to do a certain thing. Um, so yeah, I think the life satisfaction kind of steadily going up is tied to finding roles and you know, being in a place at, at work that I'm I'm content with. So I guess in a way I, I sort of in some ways like divorced the two in terms of like my life outside of work and my career. Um, just because the things that you do outside of your they're in, outside of work are entirely yours and you own that completely. When you define work-life balance for you? Is it the number of hours you're spending at work or is it something more qualitative? Hmm, That's a good question. It's probably, probably both really. Like the hours that you spend at work for sure, right? Like I want to work, I want to work 
eight to five. Obviously, sometimes that changes. It's not always like that. And I'm not I'm not being strict in saying it has to be that time every day. Sometimes I'm working on projects and maybe it takes me longer um, or have meetings. So having my my weekends to myself is, is really important. I do a lot of stuff outdoors, which requires me to drive somewhere and potentially be camping or be spending time outdoors where I'm, I don't have the ability to go and like check my laptop. Um, but also I think for like work-life balance, you know, um, not having a toxic workplace or a toxic boss, um, or, you know, a, a yeah, toxic sort of environment where all of that stress from the day bleeds into the rest of your, the rest of your life and the time after work, because then it's like, you're just bringing all that stuff with you. Um, that negative kind of energy to the rest of the things that you do. I really respect the fact that you set clear boundaries at work. It's something that I'm still struggling with and definitely something I'd love to learn more from you on. One part that I'd love to close off with is your net worth graph. So you have steadily been making progress on it. You still have some student loans, um, but it is just on the cusp of getting fully paid off. So congratulations in advance. (laughs) The part that I want to ask is, given how long it's taken you to deal with student loans, et cetera, looking back, do you think you would have gone through the same college experience or would you have made a different choice? I try not to dwell so much on the past, um, you are who you are today based on all those things that happened to you before, whether negative or positive. So yeah, for sure, I would have done some things differently, but it's happened and I had a great experience. And I don't think that I made any like um, incredibly poor choices. It's not like, I, you know, it's not like, it's not like I made choices where I was just like, that was completely irresponsible. I I don't think that. I think that everything sort of had a reason and a purpose. So really I would say, no, I would just focus on having that as a lesson and moving forward and figuring out how I can, um, how I can draw back that lesson into things that I do today. Um, And I'm also the type of person that like, I'm paying, I'm paying them off. I'm paying my loans but I don't let it dictate my life. Mm. Um, I don't want to be living on a shoestring sort of budget for all of my 20s just so that I pay them off completely within you know a certain amount of time. I want to enjoy all of this time as well, um, knowing that I will pay them off and it's equally as important for me to enjoy my time now and the other things that I like to do um, as it will be you know, in 20 or 30 years. So yeah, like I guess that's sort of sort of my my uh, my thought process, my my approach to you know juggling student loans and everything else that you've got to to pay for in in a big city. I'm not sure if it's your geography training, but I just love how you are fully aware of the context and the balance, whether it be for your career or your financial life, You're just able to bring that balance. In terms of financial impact, though, understood student loans are of your past. There is a future-looking financial impact that you mentioned was top of mind, which was supporting your mother. Is that something that's dictating your financial slash career decisions? I think a lot of us are thinking about sort of elder parent and supporting them in different ways. Would love to hear mm-hmm. how that's um, playing out in your life. I just feel like my parents did so much for me and I am so close to them that it feels only sort of natural and right that at some point, you know, I will kind of give back to them in some way. Curious, was this thought something that came about because you had conversations with your parents about their financial situations and what might be needed or expected down the line? Or is this more of the observations that you've made and your own conclusion? My own sort of assumptions or my, my own sort of uh, conclusions that I've come to um, based on my observations exactly. Um, 
Yeah. Being an only child myself, this is a conversation that I've been slowly having with my parents as well. So it's it's very interesting to see how different families are going about it. Everything from in the long, long future, um, how they might want to be treated, their bodies, mm. uh, to what we might need to do with their finances, etc. So it's, yeah. Definitely part of adulting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Last question I wanted to ask was, you mentioned there was a point in your life, something that happened recently. Unfortunately, your friend went through a tragedy and it really changed how you looked at your priorities. I'm wondering, throughout this conversation, you've shared a lot of ways of how you really look at things in a very balanced way, in a very contextualized way. Was this the influence of seeing what your friend went through or how has your mental mode sort of shifted afterwards? Mm. I think my approach to things is based on a lot of like just the way that I was raised, the way that my parents think about things. I mentioned um, that I am an only child, so I, and I grew up very close to both of them. Um, I spent a lot of time with them growing up, so I really inherited, I think, a lot of ideas that they have. Um, so I think that has been a, a big driver in, in the way that I think about things. I'll leave out the details, but a friend essentially passed away on a trip that I was on traveling internationally. And it happened, it was a very sudden illness um, that took them. And it and it and it it was the it was the dichotomy between this horrible sort of tragedy that happened with like the place that we were in, which was supposed to be this trip of a lifetime. It, the backdrop was like incredible. You know, it's a it was a bucket list sort of trip. And then this horrible thing happens in this beautiful place. It, it sort of really further, I think, solidified all of the things that I sort of believe in and uh, help kind of drive me every day, that there are certain priorities in life and those are unique to you, but you should always try to like have them in sight and always be thinking about whatever those priorities are to you. Um, and anything really can happen at any time. So making sure that like, um, you know, they say it, live every day, you know, all that live, love, live life to the fullest and all that sort of stuff. You're like being the person who you want to look back on and think I was being the, the best person that I could be. Like I was being ethical. I was being morally good. Those sorts of things are important to me when it comes to my career that I am making moves upwards, that I'm happy, fulfilled, and all the things that I do outdoors, climbing, hiking, backpacking, um, the friends that I have, really being driven to make sure that the things you're doing every day, every week, every month are lining up with like the priorities in your life. Losing somebody so young and thinking about all the possibilities that he had in his life that he doesn't get to do, I want to make sure that I'm living my life then like the best way possible um, to be able to sort of honor his memory in a, in a way that for me makes sense, I guess. Ava, thank you so much for sharing. Cool. All right. Bye-bye, Minky. Bye. -bye, Minky.